When you're a married man, Sammy Bell, you'll understand a good many things as you don't understand now. But whether it's worthwhile going through so much to learn so little is a matter of taste. Subdue your appetites, my dears, and you've conquered human nature. Accidents will happen in the best regulated families. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, nor whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show. To begin my life with the beginning of my life, I recall that I was born, as I have been informed and believe, on a Friday at 12 o'clock at night. It was remarked that the clock began to strike and I began to cry simultaneously. <laughs> Charles Dickens was born on February the 7th, 1812, at Portsmouth, into the elegant England of the Prince Regent. When he was five, his parents moved to the Medway towns of Rochester and Chatham. There he spent the most formative years of his childhood. The Dickens family lived in a small house in the genteel part of Chatham. Charles was the eldest son and worshipped his father. As kind-hearted and generous a man as ever lived in the world. His father was a clerk in the Navy pay office in Chatham. Jovial, energetic and more flamboyant than his small income and minor position would allow. He was continually running up debts. Together, father and son used to explore the old cathedral city and the surrounding countryside. And it was with his father rather than his mother that Charles found stimulating adult companionship. Walking up from the valley of the River Medway, they would stop at the top of Gad's Hill to gaze admiringly at the big house. If you were to work hard and be persevering, one day you might come to own it. So that's impossible. For long periods, he was left to amuse himself. He was, as he said later, a very small and not over particularly taken care of boy. My father had a small collection of books in a little room upstairs to which I had access. And from that blessed room, Tom Jones, Roderick Random, the Vicar of Wakefield and Robinson Crusoe came out, a glorious host to keep me company. They kept alive my fancy and my hope of something beyond that place and time. They and the Arabian Nights. When I think of it, the picture always rises in my mind of a summer evening, the boys at play and I sitting on my bed reading as if for life. Every place in the neighborhood, every stone in the castle, every foot of the churchyard had some association of its own in my mind, connected with these books, and stood for some locality made famous in them. My early readings and early imaginations dated from this place, and I took them away full of innocent construction and guileless belief. The carefree days of his Kentish childhood were to seem the happiest of his life, particularly days spent with his childhood sweetheart, Lucy Strugill, the girl who lived next door.
In his novels, Dickens was to hark back to these days over and over again. Rochester was dominated by its cathedral. Venturing alone into its eerie vastness was like looking down the throat of old time himself. The crypt, especially with its gloomy shadows and echoes of ghosts, called to mind all too vividly the books he read and the hair-raising stories he was told at bedtime. Then said the lovely bride, Dear Captain Murderer, I see no meat. And the captain humorously retorted, Look in the glass. So she looked in the glass, but she still could see no meat. So she rolled out the crust, dropping great tears on it all the time because he was so cross. Then the captain called, I see the meat in the glass. And the bride looked up at the glass just in time to see him cutting her head off. And he cut her in pieces and peppered and salted her and put her in the pie and sent it to the baker and ate it all. And bit the bones. Oi! In you get, you young whippersnapper! December 1822. His father was transferred to Somerset House in London and Charles, after staying behind to finish his school term, was sent to join his family. The smell of the damp straw in which I was packed like game and forwarded, carriage paid, to the Cross Keys, Wood Street, Cheapside. There was no other inside passenger and I consumed my sandwiches in solitude and dreariness and it rained hard all the way and I thought that life was sloppier than I had expected to find it. I lay more than half asleep and less than half awake revolving a thousand matters in my wandering imagination. Christmas at the family's cheerless new London home in Camden Town. At the age of ten, Dickens came face to face with the economic facts of life. His father, who had continued to live beyond his means, was deep in debt. This was the first of many blows that were to alter Dickens' life. Twenty-two lamb chops! Fourteen pigs trotters and a succulent cow's udder. With three dozen loaves of bread and a score of penny pudding. In a real. For three weeks. Making six shillings and eight pence farthing. Unpaid. Which I cannot wait for. Call a constable. Fetch the baby. Arrest them. <laughs> The shock of his father's arrest was the start of Charles's determination to be a success. He never forgot his father clinging to his dignity in the debtor's prison and pointing the model of his own failure. Take warning that if a man has 20 pound a year and spends 19 pound 19 and 6, he will be happy. But a shilling spent the other way will make him miserable. In an evil hour for me, it was proposed that I should go into Warren's blacking factory, 30 Strand, to be useful as I could at a salary of six shillings a week. The offer was accepted very willingly by my father and mother, and on a Monday morning, I went down to the blacking warehouse to begin my business life. Ah, oh, here's the new cove. Come over here. My work was to cover the pots of paste blacking. 
Put it down over the top. One of the boys in ragged apron and paper cap showed me the trick of using the string and tying the knot. His name was Bob Fagin, and I took the liberty of using his name long afterwards in Oliver Twist. But no words can express the secret agony of my soul as I sunk into this companionship, compared these everyday associates with those of my happier childhood. My whole nature was penetrated with grief and humiliation. Even now it is a matter of some surprise to me that I can so easily have been thrown away at such an age. A child of excellent abilities and with strong powers of observation, quick, eager, delicate and so soon hurt bodily and mentally. It seems wonderful to me that nobody should have made any sign on my behalf. But none was made. And I became at ten years old a little labouring hind. I felt my hopes of growing up to be a learned and distinguished man crushed in my bosom. But for the mercy of God, I might easily have been, for any care that was taken of me, a little robber or a little vagabond, as, insufficiently and unsatisfactorily fed, I lounged about the streets. So he was turned loose on a new world. And quickly, eagerly, his strong powers of observation took in the scenes he was to describe in his books. Covent Garden, thronged with carts of all sizes and descriptions. The pavement strewed with decayed cabbage leaves, broken hay bands, and all the indescribable litter of a market. Men are shouting, carts backing, horses neighing, boys fighting, basket women talking, donkeys braying. My usual way home was over Blackfriars Bridge and down into Blackfriars Road, past the pawn shop, one of the numerous receptacles for misery and distress with which the streets of London unhappily abound. The policeman at the street corner, the baked potato man, the kidney pie man, the pineapples and the raisin puddings, flat fish, oyster and fruit vendors linger hopelessly in the gutter in vain endeavour to attract customers. The noise of shouting and quarrelling issues from the public houses. Wretched houses with broken windows packed with rags offer gin and sweetstuffs manufactured on the premises. Filth everywhere, starvation in the attics, men and women in every variety of scanty apparel, lounging, scolding, drinking, smoking, squabbling, fighting and swearing. Dickens was rescued from the blacking factory when his father's debts were paid off by a legacy. He returned to school and was then placed in a solicitor's office, but his identification with the suffering of others never left him. The sudden moving of a taper across the window of a public hospital denotes the chamber where so many forms are writhing with pain or wasting with disease. A feverish slumber, a low moan of pain, the long forgotten prayer of a dying man. In Gray's Inn Lane, not long ago, an old maid lived a life of woe. She was fifty-three with a face like Pam, and she fell in love with... The By the age of twenty, Dickens was fighting his way up in the world, and was an accepted guest in middle-class drawing rooms. He had even fallen in love with a banker's daughter, Mariah Beadno. His past was buried forever. He was a handsome dog's meat. In the solicitor's office, he had taught himself shorthand in his spare time. He made himself into a reporter, first of court cases, then of election meetings and parliamentary debates. His ambition was boundless. Quiet! Naughty little thing. Mr. Dickens is not a bird. There, full of favourite caramel. Sweet lady. Sweet boy. I was not merely over head and ears in love with her, 
but I was saturated through and through. Enough love might have been wrung out of me, metaphorically speaking, to drown anybody in. And yet there would have remained enough within me and all over me to pervade my entire existence. Dickens' work as a reporter earned him five guineas a week, not nearly enough to be an acceptable suitor for Mariah. I, the moonstruck slave, perambulated round and round the garden for two hours, looking through crevices in the palings, getting my chin by dint of violent exertion above the rusty nails on the top, blowing kisses at the lights in the windows, and romantically calling on the night at intervals to shield my love. I don't know exactly what from, I suppose from fire, but perhaps from mice, to which he had a great exception. Oh, I do so admire the scent of geraniums. Kind, sir. Jim. There, my little pet. Mm. Jove knows I love but who. Lips do not move. No man must know. No, no, no. With command of the audience as soon as you enter. And the pen, they're not fish. They're to be used thus. No, 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 no. From the wrist right through to the tips of the fingers. That's it. Wrist, fingers, wrist, fingers. Dickens was determined somehow to get on in the world. He even considered becoming an actor. Tis but fortune. All is fortune. You see, with Garrick, the whole man, the whole body was slave to his racket. His drive and energy were phenomenal. He worked as a reporter for two papers at once, went to the theater, wrote his first short stories, read in the British Museum, and took acting lessons. I practiced industriously, even such things as walking in and out, sitting down in a chair, often four, five, six hours a day, shut up in my own room, or walking about in the fields, or with my acting master. I prescribed to myself, too, a special system for learning parts, and learned a great many. No, no, stop, it's impossible. You cannot sit like that. Now look, one foot behind the other, bend the knee and flow. Oh. I can barely bring myself to say it, but our meetings of late have been little more than so many displays of heartless indifference on the one hand, while on the other they have never failed to prove a fertile source of wretchedness and misery to me. I would feel it mean and contemptible of me to keep by me one gift of yours, or to preserve one single line or word of remembrance of affection from you. I therefore return them, and only wish that I could as easily forget that I ever received them. Then in December 1833, he picked up the monthly magazine from a bookstore. The magazine helped unknown authors by presenting their work without payment. Dickens had submitted his first short story, A Dinner at Poplar Walk. It was there, in all the glory of print. My eyes were so dimmed with pride that they could not bear the street and were not fit to be seen there. They sent me a polite and flattering communication, requesting more. Perhaps now, Maria, whom he had courted for four years, would be impressed enough to accept him. No, Mr. Dickens. No. I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I do. Say after me, I, Charles Dickens, I, Charles Dickens, take thee, Catherine Hogarth, take thee, Catherine Hogarth. Catherine Hogarth was the daughter of a newspaper colleague. Dickens married her on the 2nd of April, 1836, after Maria had refused him. Compared with Maria, Catherine was rather dull. Nevertheless, Dickens loved her sincerely and aimed to bring the same determination to marriage as to everything else. Instead of a moping solitude of chambers, there will always be the warm companionship of our own fireside, where we will sit. And I will tell her rationally what I've been doing through a day whose pursuits and labors will all have for their mainspring her advancement and happiness. But by marrying Catherine, he married the entire Hogarth family. Her father, her mother, her brother, her baby sisters, her sister Georgina, and her sister Mary, who was to live in the house with them. 
Certainly, my dear Catherine. I am of the opinion that Turkey carpets are a necessity for people of Even heart. in the first crowded months of marriage, Dickens continued to work. Out of the hack job of writing the text to a series of sporting illustrations, he created a comic novel to be issued in monthly installments. It was to be called The Pickwick Papers. I think red Turkey carpets. Dickens worked through all distractions, encouraged by the sympathetic understanding of his admiring young sister-in-law, Mary. But I really must determine the opinion of Charles. Out! Darling! <laughs> Naughty puss! Go away! From the start, it was in Mary, not his wife, Catherine, that he found the warmth and calm that he so deeply needed. She became the grace and life of our home. So perfect a creature never breathed. That's very and in order to illustrate your taste to your husband's friends, I insist that everything should be chosen to match. My friend, Mr. Snodgrass, has a great taste for poetry, replied Mr. Pickwick. So has Mrs. Leo Hunter, sir. She has produced some delightful pieces herself, sir. But I dislike Brown. You may have met with her ode to an expiring frog, sir. I don't think I have, said Mr. Pickwick. But mama, cream is so much prettier. Charles? Brown. Do you not think brown for the curtain? Or cream brocade? Such poetry, such passion. Pray be serious, Mr. Dickens. Then neither to offend my new wife nor my new mother, I'll hazard amphibious green. On a log, expiring frog. Beautiful, said Mr. Pickwick. Fine, so simple. The next verse is still more touching, said Mr. Leo Hunter. It runs thus. Say have friends, fiends, say have fiends in shape of boys with wild halloo and brutal noise, hunted thee from marshy joys with a dog, expiring frog. With the publication of the fifth installment of Pickwick Papers, in which Mr. Pickwick first meets Sam Weller, the book seized the imagination of the public. It was hailed as a triumph. Judges on the bench and boys in the street, gravity and folly, the young and old, those who are entering life and those who are quitting it, alike find it to be irresistible. The comic adventures of the members of the Pickwick Club became the greatest success story in publishing history. Dickens received over £3,000 for his work and was able to give up reporting. Mr. Pickwick and his friends became national heroes. By Christmas 1836, Dickens, still only 24, was famous. Well done, Charles. Oh, Charles. You're even more of a child than the rest of us. Charles, give us the Pickwick Carol. Yes. Oh, yes, do. But my song I fall out for Christmas now. In a dark all right, if you'll all sing with me. My song I call out for Christmas, but for hearty to and go. A bumper I train with might and rain, it's bigger for bacon for toes. A bumper I train with might and rain. Mary Hogarth suddenly became ill and died. No one can conceive the misery in which this dreadful event has plunged us. Since our marriage, she has been the peace and life of our home. The admired of all for her beauty and excellence. I could have better spared a much nearer relation or an older friend. 
for she has sympathized with all my thoughts and feelings more than anyone I ever knew. She has left a blank which I never can replace. The shock of Mary's sudden death, like so many other emotional events in Dickens' life, was buried deep in his mind, never to be disclosed. Unknown even to his wife, he was to dream of Mary every night for five years. Years later, his stored-up emotions reappeared when he wrote The Death of Little Nell. For she was dead. There upon her little bed she lay at rest. The solemn stillness was no marvel now. She was dead. No sleep so beautiful and calm, so free from trace of pain, so fair to look upon. She seemed a creature fresh from the hand of God and waiting for breath of life not one who had lived and suffered death. Mary Scott Hogarth, died 7th May, 1837. Young, beautiful, and good. God, in his mercy, numbered her with his angels at the early age of 17. Dickens was so overcome with grief that for a while he couldn't write. He left London and tried to forget his sorrow in exercise. He spent whole days out riding with a new companion, John Forster, the drama critic of a London paper, who was to become a trusted friend and advisor and his first biographer. Forster encouraged Dickens to throw his energy back into his work, into his first great blow for the oppressed. I have faith. And I wish to diffuse faith in the existence of beautiful things, even in those conditions of society who are so degenerate, degraded and forlorn, that at first sight it would seem as though they could not be described but by a strange and terrible reversal of scripture. God said, let there be light, and there was none. The Industrial Revolution had brought an age of unprecedented brutality. Young children were forced to work up to 14 hours or more each day in mines and factories under the most appalling conditions. Dickens threw himself into campaigns for new laws to protect children at work. He took up his pen on behalf of those who couldn't fend for themselves. He attacked the poor law, a law that forced orphans, the old, the sick and the destitute into workhouses where life was deliberately made cruel and inhuman so that people wouldn't live off the rates. The children in the jails are common sights to me, but these are worse, for they have not yet arrived there, but are as plainly and as certainly travelling there as they are to their graves. Thousands of immortal creatures who cannot, in their present state, be held responsible for what they do. We have come to this absurd, this dangerous, this monstrous pass, that the dishonest felon is, in respect of cleanliness, order, diet and accommodation, better provided for and taken care of than the honest pauper. Poverty bred violence. The authorities fought the violence with oppressive laws and harsh punishments. But about the poverty from which it sprang, they did nothing. In Oliver Twist and Nicholas Nickleby, Dickens wove into his stories a great cry of compassion and reproach. With every kindly sympathy and affection blasted in its birth, with every young and healthy feeling flogged and starved down, with every revengeful passion that can fester in swollen hearts, eating its evil way to their core in silence, 
what an incipient hell was breeding here. <laughs> The summer of 1842, Dickens at Broadstairs on holiday. At 30, he was so famous that part of the promenade had to be roped off to give him some privacy. Catherine's second sister, Georgina Hogarth, had become a permanent member of the family and helped with a growing number of children. But the success of the summer was undoubtedly Miss Eleanor P, one of Dickens' numerous women admirers. <laughs> is a combination of thy intoxicating beauty and the sea air. Oh, oh no faster, no faster, tell him to stop, or I shall die. Fair enslaver, fain would I thread the mazes of this saraband with thee. The saraband is slow, Mr. Dickens. Struggle, poor bird. You are powerless in the claw of such a kite as this. Oh, oh, my dress. Oh, my best dress. My only silk dress will be ruined. Oh, Mrs. Dickens, help me. Make Mr. Dickens let me go. Charles, how can you be so silly? Yeah. You must be carried off by the waves and you'll ruin the poor girl's dress. Dress? Yeah. Talk not to me of dress. Am I not immolating a brand new pair of patent leathers? As yet unpaid for. Oh, oh I shall drown. Then, oh, beloved of my soul. As we stand on the brink of the great mystery, let your mind dwell on the column in the Times, wherein will be vividly described the fate of the lovely Eleanor P, drowned by Dee in a fit of dementia. Well, Charles? and even the seagulls repented of their early marriages, like men and women. Now for my next diabolical deception, I have here a canister, empty, which I fill with common or garden bran. As a father, Dickens reveled in performing ingenious conjuring tricks at nursery parties, but he resented the inconvenience of his growing family and the responsibility. Aldi Baronti Foscico. This is Hubert, the soldier. He's going on a long journey, so he needs his cloak. By the late 1840s, the sheer number of their children, they had eight and another on the way, were driving him and Catherine apart. The task of bearing them and bringing them up left poor Catherine with little energy or enthusiasm for her role as the wife of a celebrity. Running the household fell more and more onto his sister-in-law, Georgina, as Catherine became less capable with each successive child. Flower! Outwardly, Dickens was a self-confident and respectable public figure, a friend of the great, an upholder of the Victorian ideals of happy family life, the author of jolly Christmas stories, the life and soul of every party. Mr. Foster, the magic taper, if you please. but he faced growing disillusion. The public applauded, but nothing was done about the reforms he urged. With such a large family to support, he still didn't feel financially secure, and now the miseries of his childhood came back to haunt him. Forster heard of an elderly gentleman who recognized the great Mr. Dickens as the miserable little boy who once worked in Warren's blacking factory. Parts of his past he had told to no one, not even to his wife. 
Forster persuaded him to begin an autobiography, but the truth was too painful. Only in the guise of a novel could he make his confessional to himself and the world. Aldi Baronti Fosfico Formio. Only by transforming him into Mr. Micawber could he accept the shame of his father in the debtor's prison. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 19 pounds, 19 and 6. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds, ought and 6. Result, misery. The full title of the novel is the personal history and observations of David Copperfield the Younger, which he never meant to be published on any account. In most respects, it was Dickens' own story, more autobiographical than even his closest friends suspected. Of course I was in love with little Emily. I'm sure I loved that baby, quite as truly, quite as tenderly, with greater purity and more disinterestedness than can enter into the best love of a greater time of life, high and ennobling as it is. I'm sure my fancy raised up something round that blue-eyed mite of a child, which etherealized and made a very angel of her. The days sported by us, as if time had not grown up himself yet, but were a child too, and always at play. As to the sense of inequality or youthfulness or other difficulty in our way, little Emily and I had no such trouble, because we had no future. We made no more provision for growing older than we did for growing younger. fulfilled my destiny. I was captive and a slave. I loved Dora Spenlow to distraction. alone in front of the geranium, and Dora often stopped to admire this one and that one, and I stopped to admire the same one, and Dora, laughing, held the dog up childishly to smell the flowers. And if we were not all three in fairyland, certainly I was. In the novel, David Copperfield marries his beloved Dora, and the desperate desire that Dickens had to marry Maria in the world of fact was consummated in the world of fiction. But with marriage, Dora changes. She is transmuted into a woman very similar to the inept Catherine Hogarth. She ceases to be the ideal. Her attractive silliness becomes a bore. Dickens, through the novel, faced the unhappiness of his own marriage. Sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. In fulfillment of the compact I have made with myself to reflect my mind on this paper, I again examine it closely and bring its secrets to the light. What I missed, I still regarded, I always regarded, as something that had been a dream of my youthful fancy, that was incapable of realization. That I was now discovering to be so with some natural pain, as all men did, but that it would have been better for me if my wife could have helped more and shared the many thoughts in which I had no partner. There can be no disparity in marriage like unsuitability of mind and purpose. In the novel, Dickens didn't have to face the logical outcome of an unhappy marriage. Dora Spenlow was made to fade consumptively away, allowing David Copperfield to find true happiness with a romantic ideal of womanhood called Agnes Wickfield. When all else fades, one face remains, one face shining on me like a heavenly light by which I see all other objects. I turn my head and see it in its beautiful serenity beside me. My lamp burns low and I have written far into the night, but the dear presence without which I am nothing bears me company. O oh, Agnes of my soul, so may thy face be by me when I close my life indeed, so may I when realities are melting from me, like the shadows which I now dismiss, 
still find thee near me, pointing upward. War in the Crimea. So the people are to be made fools of again, made to sing their own death song in rule Britannia and allow their own wrongs and sufferings to be obscured by cannon smoke and blood mists. Government advanced this war without giving a thought to the wretchedness engendered by cholera, of which in London alone, an infinitely larger number of English people than are likely to be slain in the whole Russian war have miserably and needlessly died. Dickens saw the government using the war as a further excuse to delay reform. In his mature novels, Bleak House, Little Dorrit and Hard Times, he returned to the battle for the oppressed. He attacked the heartlessness of the factory owners. They were ruined when they were required to send labouring children to school. They were ruined when inspectors were appointed to look into their work. They were ruined when such inspectors considered it doubtful whether they were justified in chopping people up with their machinery. It was hinted that they need not always make quite so much smoke. Smoke? That's meat and drink to us. It's the healthiest thing in all the world in all respects and particularly for the lungs. The work in our mills is the pleasantest work there is and it's the best paid work there is. Besides that, we couldn't improve the mills themselves unless we laid down turkey carpets on the floors, which we're not a gonna do. As to our hands, there's not a hand in this town, sir, man, woman or child, but has one ultimate object in life. That object is to be fed turtle soup and venison on a golden spoon. But none of them's going to be, for all the humbugging sentiment in Great Britain and Ireland, Another target was the pulpit and the hypocrites who preached there. It is because you know nothing, my young friend, that you are to us a gem and jewel. For what are you, my young friend? You are a human boy, my young friend. A human boy. Oh, glorious to be a human boy. And why glorious, my young friend? Because you are capable of receiving the lessons of wisdom. Because you are capable of profiting from this discourse, which I now deliver for your good. Because you are not a stick or a staff or a stock or a stone or a post or a pillar, a running stream of sparkling joy to be a soaring human boy. So let us be joyful, joyful, let us be joyful. And my young friend, I wish for peace upon you and yours. And another obstacle to change, the law. Repeal this statute, my good sir. Repeal it, my dear sir. Never with my consent. Alter the law. The same disillusion which coloured his novels pervaded Dickens' private life. The happiness of his past seemed to recede into another world. Then, on Saturday, February the 10th, 1855, a figure from the past returned to call on him. Her married name was Maria Winter. It is impossible to overstate the feeling of 25 years ago if you will only think what the desperate intensity of my nature is, and that it excluded every other idea from my mind for four years, at a time of life when four years was equal to four times four, and that I went at it with a determination to overcome all the difficulties which lifted me up and floated me away over a hundred men's heads. Nothing can exaggerate that. And to see the mere cause of it all now loosens my hold upon myself. Charlie, my sweet boy. Madam. Is that all you have to say to me after we've been so fond of one another? Madam, I hardly know what to say. Then say nothing. Just plant a kiss on my cheek for the sake of memory. Tossing her head with a caricature of her girlish manner, this grotesque revival of what once had been prettily natural to her was like trying to resuscitate an old play when the stage was dusty 
when the scenery was faded, when the youthful actors were dead, when the orchestra was empty, when the lights were out. Flora, who had seemed enchanting in all she said and thought, was diffuse and silly. That was much. Flora, who had been spoiled and artless long ago, was determined to be spoiled and artless now. That was a fatal blow. Mr. F was so devoted to me, you could never bear me out of his sight, said Flora. Mariah was turned into Flora Finching in Little Dorrit and offered to the public. Dickens had begun reading his stories in public almost by accident for charity. The performances were extremely popular and profitable. He continued them for his own benefit. Romance, however, Flora went on, as I openly said to Mr. F when he proposed to me. And you'll be surprised to hear he proposed seven times, once in a hackney coach, once in a boat, once in a pew, once on a donkey at Tunbridge Wells, and the rest on his knees. Romance has fled. <laughs> Very strange to you, coming here again. Dickens' regular companion was Georgina. He relied on her completely to manage his home. His wife, Catherine, after ten children and four miscarriages in 15 years, was now totally incapacitated. And it was with Georgina that Dickens returned to the countryside of his childhood. The same places he once explored with his father. If you were to work hard and be persevering, one day you might come to own it. Dickens bought Gad's Hill in 1856, the same year that he met an 18-year-old actress called Ellen Turnham. She was the leading lady in a play Dickens was rehearsing for a charity performance. were literary friends, notably the novelist Wilkie Collins. <laughs> Ellen Turnham was younger even than Dickens' two grown-up daughters. The house, they were to say later, seemed to be full of I'm not to be your dear friend now. The play was called Uncle John. Dickens took the part of an old man infatuated with his young ward. Dear Uncle. John. John! Oh, you are so kind. It's no trouble to fall in love. It's trouble enough to fall out of it once you're in it. So I keep out of it altogether. It were better that you were to do the same. That's impossible. A little whim of mine. Present for my little wife. Bridal presents? Oh, sir, you are too generous. I know not what to say. Say nothing. In the play, to show his affection, the old man lavishes expensive gifts on the beautiful young girl. In real life, Dickens couldn't help doing the same. But a package from the jeweler was delivered into the wrong hands. And takes the sweet My dearest Ellen, I know you will know not what to say, so say nothing. My dear Catherine, it is perfectly customary, as you are very well aware, for a producer of a play to give a token of his gratitude to his leading lady. An expensive bracelet I take to be more than a token. I see you are determined to take it to mean exactly what you like. Where else can I interpret your innocent gesture? I've never been so humiliated in my life. Yes, my own home, surrounded by my children. I find your suspicions hideous and degrading. Don't humiliate. Not only hideous and degrading to me, but to one who is as innocent and pure of any of the motives which you are imputing to her as virgin snow. I can't bear it. And I trust when you've come to your senses, you will think differently of the matter and order from your mind all that is base and suspicious and ugly and pay a respectful visit to Miss Turnham's mother. Oh. 
I thought better of you, Catherine. I thought better. <laughs> Mama, you shall not go. <laughs> if your father insists, child, then I must. Mr. Dickens is a wicked, wicked man. Mr. Dickens is not wicked. Mr. Dickens is a genius. Oh, the whole world must know that this woman who claims to be an actress is Mr. Dickens' mistress. The marriage was over. It broke up into a long, drawn-out family row about money and the terms of the separation. Only Georgina stayed loyal to Dickens. Neither you nor anyone else can lay the fiction at my door that Mr. Dickens is of my flesh and blood. The rumours about his relationship with Ellen Ternan were fanned into scandal when a letter he wrote about Catherine fell into the hands of the American press and was published across the world. Mrs. Dickens and I have lived unhappily together for many years. Hardly anyone who knows us intimately can fail to know that we are in all respects of character and temperament wonderfully unsuited to each other. In the manly consideration which I owe my wife, I will remark of her that the peculiarity of her character has thrown all our children onto someone else, and that a mental disorder under which she sometimes labours was such that she felt herself unfit for the life she has to lead as my wife. Wicked persons have coupled this separation with the name of a young lady for whom I have a great attachment and regard. I will not repeat her name. I honour it too much. This was too much for conventional Victorian society. The newspapers, after publishing the letter, bitterly attacked him. This favourite of the public informs some thousands of readers that his wife, whom he has vowed to love and cherish, has utterly failed to discharge the duties of a mother and further hints that her mind is disordered. If this be manly consideration, we should like to be favoured with a definition of unmanly selfishness and heartlessness. Dickens' private life, it seemed, would bring his public life to an end. June the 17th, 1858, Dickens was 46. The audience waited for him to give his first public reading since the scandal of separation from his wife. His friends feared he would be booed off the stage, but he went on despite their advice. I know, sir. I remember your advice and acknowledge it with thanks. Whenever I was wrong, I was obliged to anyone who would tell me of it. But up to the present, I have never been wrong. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show. To begin my life with the beginning of my life, I record that I was born, as I have been informed... Would to God every letter I had ever written were on that pile. In the garden of his new home at Gad's Hill, Dickens made a bonfire of his letters a symbolic burning of his past before he built himself a new life. The princess I adore. But Ellen Ternan and he would never be really happy together. After the separation from his wife, Dickens lived at Gad's Hill with Georgina as his hostess. Ellen visited him there, but convention made it impossible for her to live openly with him as his mistress. More important, being so much younger, she could never satisfy his emotional needs, fill the void he had felt all his life. Disappointed, Dickens immersed himself in a new book, Great Expectations. Yeah! Ah, ah, Hang still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat. Hey, don't cut my throat, sir. Pray, no. Tell us your name, quick. Victor. What 
more. Give it mouth. Princess! Tell us where you live. Point out the place. Over there, sir. You young devil, what fat cheeks you have got. Damn me, I couldn't eat him if I hadn't half a mind to it. Oh, pray no, sir. The question is whether you're to be let live. In Great Expectations, Magwitch, a fearsome and misunderstood convict, an outcast, eventually emerges as perhaps the most admirable character. The central figure is Pip, a village boy with ambitions to be rich, respectable and a gentleman. Ambitions once Dickens owned. In this harsh fantasy, Dickens faces himself and his disappointment with Ellen Turner. A crazed old lady, Miss Havisham, jilted on her wedding day, ensnares Pip into loving the beautiful but unattainable Estella. He is made to feel all the pain of love, but none of its rewards. Your own one day, my dear. And you'll use it well. Let me see you play cards with this boy. With this boy? Why, he's a common laboring boy. Well, you couldn't break his heart. What do you play, boy? Nothing but beggar my neighbor, miss. Beggar him. <laughs> he portrayed the boy Pip growing up to worldly success as Dickens had done himself, only to discover too late that material values are false because they deaden the heart. Love her. Love her. Love her. I'll tell you what true love is. It's blind devotion, unquestioning self-humiliation, utter submission. Trust and belief against yourself, against the whole world giving up your heart and soul to the smiter. You must know that I have no heart. Oh, I have a heart to be stabbed in or shot in, I have no doubt. And of course, if it ceased to beat, I should cease to be. But you know what I mean. I have no softness there. No sympathy, sentiment, nonsense. The next novel paints London as a city of despair. A grey, dusty, withered city which has not a hopeful aspect. The closed warehouses and offices have an air of death about them. And the national dread of colour has an air of mourning. A hopeless city with no rent in the leaden canopy of its sky, steeped in a general gloom, like a dismal and enormous jail. In Our Mutual Friend, Dickens derided the members of the new self-made ruling class, the Podsnaps, whose careful respectability shut out any concern for the poverty that surrounds them. I don't want to know about it. I don't choose to discuss it. I don't admit it. The subject is a very disagreeable one. I'll go as far as to say it is an odious one. It is not to be introduced among our wives and young persons, and I remove it from the earth. After 30 years, Dickens now saw less hope of real reform than ever. One character dares to warn the Podsnaps of what may happen if nothing is done. For when we have got things to the pass, that with an enormous treasure at our disposal to relieve the poor, the best of the poor detest our mercies, hide their heads from us, shame us by starving to death in the midst of us. It is a pass impossible of prosperity, impossible of continuance. We must mend it, or in its own evil hour, it will mar every one of us. So, in his fifties, Dickens escaped more and more into the only secure emotional world he had left, his reading. Increasingly, he seemed fully alive only in the affection of his audience and behind the jolly facade of his early books. Sam Vella, my lord, replied the gentleman. Do you spell it with a V or a W, inquired the judge. Well, that depends upon the taste and fancy of the speller, my lord, replied Sam. I never had occasion to spell it more than once or twice, but I spelled it with a wee. Here, a voice from the gallery exclaimed aloud, Quite right, too, Sammy Bell, quite right. Put it down a wee, my lord, put it down a wee. Uh, who is that who dare address the court? Said the judge. You know who that was, sir. 
I rather suspect it was my father, my lord. No, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzbuzz. Now, sir, replied Sam. I believe you are in the service of Mr. Pickwick, the defendant in this case. Speak up, if you please, Mr. Weller. I mean to speak up, sir, replied Sam. I am in the service of that dear gentleman, and a very good service it is. Little to do and plenty to get, I suppose, said Sergeant Buzzbuzz with jocularity. Oh, quite enough to get, sir, as the soldier said when they ordered him 350 lashes, replied Sam. You must not tell us what the soldier or any other man said, sir, interposed the judge. It's not evident. <laughs> C-L-E-A-N, clean, verb active, to make bright, to scour. W-I-N, win, D-E-R, der, winder, a casement. When the boy knows this out of the book, he goes and does it. <laughs> the word father is rather vulgar, my dear. The word papa, besides, gives a pretty form to the lips. Papa, potatoes, poultry, prunes and prisms are all very good words for the lips. Especially prunes and prisms. <laughs> My life, said Mr. Mandolini, is the one that damned the horrid the grind. <laughs> I positively adore Miss Dombey. I'm perfectly sore with loving her. <laughs> and you're a married man, Sammy Bell. You'll understand a good many things as you don't understand now. But whether it's worthwhile going through so much to learn so little is a matter of taste. <laughs> Kent, sir. Everybody knows Kent. Apples, cherries, hops and women. <laughs> if the law supposes that, said Mr. Bubble, the law is a ass. The law is a idiot. <laughs> Here's the rule for bargains. Do other men, for they would do you. And that's the true business precept. The profit from the tours was enormous. Six months in America alone earned him 20,000 pounds. But so was the cost to his health. Distorted eyesight, continuous tiredness, hoarseness, and nausea. Georgina and his doctor warned him that the readings were shortening his life, but he wouldn't relax. He undertook a new tour of 100 appearances and planned to include a new reading which he'd been secretly practicing for a long time, Sykes's Murder of Nancy from Oliver Twist. I'd like you to watch this particularly, as I'm very doubtful of it myself. Without one pause or moment's consideration, but looking straight before him with savage resolution, the robber held on his headlong course until he reached his own door. He opened it softly with a key, strode lightly up the stairs, and entering his own rooms, double locked the door, and lifting a heavy table against it, drew back the curtain of the bed. The girl was lying, half-dressed upon it. He had roused her from her sleep, for she raised herself with a hurried and startled look. Get up, said the man. It is you, Bill said the girl, with an expression of pleasure at his return. It is. Get up! And taking the candle that was burning in the candlestick, hurled it under the grate. Seeing the faint light of early day without, the girl rose to undraw the curtain. Let it be, said Sykes, thrusting his hand before her. There's light enough for what I've to do. Bill, said the girl, in the low voice of alarm, why do you look like that at me? The robber sat regarding her for a few seconds, then, grasping her by the head and throat, dragged her into the middle of the room and placed his heavy hand upon her mouth. After a successful tryout, the murder reading was included in the tour, but a doctor had to travel with him to keep him going. Bill, Bill, gasped the girl, wrestling with the strength of mortal fear. I, I won't scream or, or cry, not once. Hear me, speak to me, tell me what I've done. The readings took so much out of him that Georgina and the doctor feared that Dickens might actually die on the stage. Then spare my life for the love of heaven. Bill, dear 
Bill, you cannot have the heart to kill me. But we must have time. A little, little time. His reading of the murder became an obsession. He included it in three performances out of every four. Think of all I've given up only this night for you. Stop before you spill my blood. I've been true to you. For my guilty soul, I have. At the intervals, he collapsed, unable even to speak until the performance continued. The housebreaker freed one arm and grasped his pistol. The certainty of immediate detection, if he fired, flashed across his mind even in his fury. And he beat it, twice, with all the force that he could summon upon the upturned face that almost touched his own. Lame, bleeding from the bowels, partly paralyzed, he still refused to stop. He had to be kept going on alcohol and sedatives. She staggered and fell, nearly blinded with the blood that rained down from a deep gash in her forehead. But raising herself with difficulty upon her knees, drew from her bosom a white handkerchief, and holding it up in her folded hands, as high toward heaven as her feeble strength would allow, breathed one prayer for mercy to her maker. There is a fixed expression of horror of me all over the theater, as if I were going to be hanged. It was a ghastly figure to look upon. The murderer staggered backward to the wall and shutting out the sight with his hand, seized a heavy club and struck her down. It is a new sensation for me to be execrated with such unanimity, and I hope it will remain so. And then, grasping her by the head and throat, dragged her into the middle of the room and placed his heavy hand upon her mouth. I have a vague sensation of being wanted by the police. I have murderous instinct. And beat it, twice, with all the force that he could summon, upon the upturned face that almost touched his own. Twice, with all the force that he could summon. Please, 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 tell me what I've done. Grasped her by the head and throat, dragged her into the middle of the room. Oh, I think of all I have given up only this night for you. Stop before you spill my blood. I have been true to you upon my guilty soul, I have. Seized the heavy club and struck her down. Spare my life for the love of heaven. Bill, dear Bill, you, you cannot have the heart to kill me. And he beat it twice with all the force that he could summon upon the upturned face that almost touched his own. The murder should be saved and kept for occasional readings in the large towns. For occasional readings in the large towns. I am not old. I am not sick. you to do as I like. Much better to die doing. But he stopped. On the night of the 15th of March, 1870, he gave his final reading from Pickwick. Georgina thought he never looked more handsome in his life. Ladies and gentlemen, it would be worse than idle, for it would be hypocritical and unfeeling if I were to disguise that I close this episode of my life with feeling a very considerable pain. For some 15 years, I have had the honor of presenting my own cherished ideas for your recognition and have been uniformly cheered by the readiest response, the most generous sympathy, and the most stimulating support. Nevertheless, I have thought it well, henceforth, to devote myself exclusively to the art that first brought us together. And so, from these garish lights, I now vanish forevermore to the heartfelt, 
grateful, respectful, affectionate. Farewell. But even now, Dickens found himself pursued by that same restlessness that had driven him all his life. He poured himself into another book, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, set in the scenes of his childhood. A few strange faces in the street, a few other faces, half strange, half familiar. Once the faces of children, now the faces of men and women who have come back from the outer world at long intervals to find the city wonderfully shrunk in size. To these, the striking of the cathedral clock and the cawing of the rooks are like voices of their nursery time. To such as these, it has happened in their dying hours afar off that they have imagined their chamber floor strewn with the autumn leaves fallen from the elm trees in the clove. So have the rustling sounds and fresh scents of their earliest impressions revived when the circle of their lives was very nearly traced and the beginning and the end were drawing close together. Again, Dickens in his writing asked himself why he had never found the elusive happiness he had missed. And still he found the answer in the harshly interrupted idyll of his childhood. So, from my earliest remembrance, I have had to suppress a deadly and bitter hatred. This has made me secret and revengeful. It has given me in my weakness to the resource of being false. I have been stinted of education, liberty, the very necessaries of life, the commonest pleasures of childhood, the commonest possessions of youth. This has caused me to be utterly wanting in I don't know what emotions or remembrances or good instincts. The mystery of Edwin Drood can be seen as Dickens' last desperate judgment of himself. The central character, John Jasper, is an almost uncanny projection of Dickens himself. He is the leader of the cathedral choir. Like Dickens, he commands influence and respect, a man who seems to the public to be a pillar of virtue. But like Dickens, John Jasper leads a double life. Behind the respectable exterior, John Jasper conceals a passion, a jealous and unbearable love for a girl who is engaged to someone else. In the soaring cathedral music, which is his gift, he hears not the pieties of religious devotion, but the reiteration of his own guilt. In this novel, Dickens' self-destructive nature seems to find a final outlet. On Christmas Eve, the very season of jollity and goodwill associated in the public mind with Dickens' writing, John Jasper plans to strangle his young rival. And Dickens, pressing ahead with his novel despite his failing health, prepared to reject all that he had stood for as a popular novelist. On the banks of the river where Dickens walked as a child, the murderer creeps up on the figure that dogs his life. 
I am mocked by the echoes of my own voice. I am a man carving demons out of my heart. Dickens never completed Edwin Drood. He died suddenly of a heart attack, killed by persistent and deliberate overwork at the age of 58. He was buried in Westminster Abbey. I direct that my name be inscribed in plain English letters on my tomb without the addition of Mr. or Esquire. And I conjure my friends on no account to make me the subject of any monument, memorial or whatsoever. I rest my claim to the remembrance of my country upon my published work.